Our Bible reading today is taken from Genesis chapter 16. Uh, you can follow along in your Bibles at home, follow along on the screen, or if you've printed off the service, follow along in that sheet. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible, Genesis 16. Abram's wife, Sarai, had not borne him children. She owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Sarai said to Abram, since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave, perhaps I can have children by her. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar, her Egyptian slave, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife for him. This happened after Abram had lived in the land of Canaan 10 years. He said with Hagar and she became pregnant. When she realized she was pregnant, she looked down on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you're responsible for my suffering. I put my slave in your arms and ever since she saw that she was pregnant, she's looked down on me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Abram replied to Sarai, here, your slave is in your hands. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarai mistreated her so much that she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, a spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She replied, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, you must go back to your mistress and submit to her mistreatment. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I'll greatly multiply your offspring and they'll be too many to count. And the angel of the Lord said to her, You've conceived and will have a son. You'll name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your cry of affliction. This man will be like a wild ass. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. He'll live at odds with all his brothers. So she named the Lord who spoke to her, the God who sees. For she said, Have I really seen here the one who sees me? That is why she named the spring a well of the living one who sees me. It's located between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave birth to Abram's son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son Hagar had. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to spend a bit of time working through that passage now. Uh, you can take notes, use the comments box at the bottom of the page uh, to send any questions, queries that you might have. Uh, please follow along in the outline uh, that's provided on the screen or in your service sheet. Uh, let me pray and let's dive into this passage together. Father, uh, your word is living and active. Uh, we are reminded of that last week as we gathered as your people with those quotes from the book of Hebrews. Uh, it is relevant. Uh, to every age and every community and every people group. Uh, it reveals the one who made us, uh, the one who saves us, uh, the one who promises and commits and changes our sinful nature. Father, please apply your word to us today. It seems so distant, but it is living and active, and we pray that by your spirit it will work on us today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point one on the outline. Uh, there's a crisis in world athletics. I don't know if you knew that, but but it's something that athletics freaks like me like to follow and know about. Uh, it's been revealed, surprise, surprise, that doping, the taking of performance-enhancing drugs, is rife. Uh, Russia was banned from the last Summer Olympics in Rio because of their systematic and systemic doping. Uh, they're currently banned from the Tokyo Olympics whenever they will happen. And it's already been revealed that they've started to intervene in the testing process through the use of the internet. The real shocker, though, isn't Russia. The real shocker is Kenya. Kenya has now been revealed as rife with dopers. Now, that's not earth-shattering news because we all treat professional sport with some level of suspicion. But many of us who follow athletics and especially middle and long distance running are really surprised that this has happened. The fairy tale about African runners is forever tainted. Will athletics ever recover? Now, that doesn't seem like a big question for many people. 
But it does touch on something that happens consistently in our world. There are many falls in our world. The fall of countries, the fall of governments, the fall of idols, the fall of Queensland in the state of origin, the fall of ideologies. But perhaps what strikes us most as people is when great people fall, great men and women. I remember when a friend of mine, a great minister of the gospel, fell. He'd conducted an affair for a number of years and had been discovered. It was a fall that affected many people. It was a fall that damaged a productive, gospel-loving church. It was a fall that reverberated around and around and around amongst our friendship networks. When great men and women fall, that's what happens. The effect is felt widely. The shock is tangible. The gasps are audible. Abram was a great man. He's a man of great faith. He trusted the promises of God. He's a man of great wisdom. He knew the goodness of taking God at his word. He was a man, as we learned last week, declared right with God because of what God had promised, because Abram trusted God. Abram was a great man. Moreover, as we've learned over the last few weeks, God had worked in Abram to make him great. Remember what we learn as we spend time uh, with Neil in Genesis chapter 14. God had chosen Abram to carry God's promises to save the world, to restore the world. God had promised it through Abram's family. The curse of sin would be rolled back and God's people would dwell with God under God's rule and God's word and be blessed. Now, in a world broken by human rebellion against God, Abram's greatness lay in the fact that God worked through him. Obstacles have been thrown up against that trust Abram had in God, those promises, and God had overcome them all for Abram. Abram is a great, was a great man. Abram falls. Abram fell. Now, when we read the account of this episode in Genesis chapter 16, well, we can come to no other conclusion, can we? Abram has fallen, and it should shock us. After the high points of Genesis 14 and Genesis 15, where Abram was revealed to be a man who trusted God completely, was transformed by this trust, was declared righteous by God, that fall should shock us. I mean, it's a fairly sordid family saga, that what we deal with in Genesis 16, isn't it? A sordid love triangle involving deception and pride and arrogance, a child, anger, avoidance of responsibility, great damage, mistreatment, rejection, abuse. And yet it starts with such an appearance of wisdom, such pragmatic can-do attitudes. Well, the problem is clear. Abram and his family have been in the land that God has promised them for about 10 years. Abram's 85, Sarai probably a decade younger. And there in verse 1 is the problem. Abram's wife Sarai had not born him children. She owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. No child, no family, no great nation. How long will it take for this promise of God, this good promise, to come to fulfilment? Will it ever happen? Now automatically when we read that first verse, some alarm bells should start ringing. There's the juxtaposition of the problem of no children and then the mention of Egypt. Remember the last time we went down to Egypt in Genesis 12, verse 11 and following? According to the custom of the day, Sarai decides to take matters into her own hands. She's doing what was considered wise by the world, what was considered acceptable, what countless men and women have done before. She takes her slave girl, Hagar. She gives her to Abram. They sleep together. A child is conceived. It is from his own flesh. Remember Genesis chapter 15, problem solved. The method is acceptable to the world. The result is acceptable within the realms of the promise, a child from Abram's flesh. The all-round result seems to be a win on all levels, a victory for human initiative within the promises of God. No, it's not. (laughs) It's a disaster. No one emerges from this episode. No human emerges from this episode 
with their reputations intact. Sarai has betrayed her marriage. She's used her slave woman. She's become separated from her husband. She's now consumed with jealousy and rage. Abram has done nothing, and that's a problem. He's avoided all responsibility. He's ignored the God who's proven so faithful. He's destroyed his own marriage. Hagar, proud and haughty, despising the one she should honour. And yet as we grasp and as we gasp at the fall of such a great man, we need to also acknowledge that his family, his life, sounds remarkably like ours can at some points, doesn't it? Jesus makes very clear that his people will always have what they need to be his people. Remember Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it's a very clear promise. Jesus' people have all that they need to be his people, and that is a wonderful promise, but they take so long, those promises, don't they? And I, I, I know how to bring about the promises that Jesus has made. I just need to be a little proactive, uh, take matters into my own hands. If it works, then I can give it a go, whether it's companionship, parenting, education, work, providing for my family, whatever it is that I need, I can make it happen for Jesus. I love this about the Bible, even though it's painful, searing even. It does not avoid the reality of life as we live it. Abram does not live in a vacuum. Jesus did not come in a vacuum. God's people don't live in a vacuum. There is Abram revealed in all the same warts and insecurities as me. He is not airbrushed, largely because Abram is not the hero. He can be seen for who he is because as we continue to see throughout Genesis, someone else is the hero. And the fall of the great man can be so hard, so clear, so obvious. Taking matters into our own hands with the promises of God will never work. God promises, God will deliver in his time, in his wisdom, in his way. To say otherwise is to, well, it's at least to fall with Abram, isn't it? But at its deepest, what does such a fall reveal? What does such an action as taking initiative to make God's promises happen, what does that reveal? Why do they happen, these falls? What can possibly be going on here to trip and tumble and bring down a man who we've seen in Genesis 14 and 15 is a man of great faith? How do we explain it, this fall? I'm at point two on the outline. Some will say it's just human nature. Now, I agree with that. But what is it about human nature that makes such a fall so common? Why does Abram fall? I think this passage in Genesis 16 provides us with some vital clues in the way it's written. Join with me in looking at Genesis 16, verses 1 to 6. Abram's wife Sarai had not borne him children. She owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Sarai said to Abram, Since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave. Perhaps I can have children by her. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar, her Egyptian slave, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife for him. This happened after Abram had lived in the land of Canaan ten years. He said with Hagar she became pregnant. When she realized she was pregnant, she looked down on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you're responsible for my suffering. I put my slave in your arms and ever since she saw that she was pregnant, she's looked down on me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Abram replied to Sarai, here, your slave is in your hands. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarai mistreated her so much that she ran away from her. When you look at that account, and especially the interaction between Abram and Sarai in verses 2 And three, some remarkable similarities emerge. Some remarkable similarities to another fall that has caused us to scratch our heads. Abram listened to, agreed with, and obeyed his wife Sarai. Verse two, the same as Adam did with Eve. Genesis 3, 17. Sarai took, verse three, just as Eve took. 
Genesis 3, verse 6. Sarai gave, verse 3, just as Eve gave. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Abram stood and said nothing, just as Adam stood and said nothing. Everything about the events of Genesis 16 mirrors exactly Genesis 3. In fact, the words used in Genesis 16, verse 2 for Abram are only used elsewhere in the Old Testament in Genesis 3, 17. The word order, the exact nouns and verbs in Genesis 16, verse 3, mirror exactly the word order and the exact nouns and verbs as Genesis 3, verse 3. The action is exactly the same. And the exact same consequence is clear. This is a fall. This is a mess. This is not how things should be. Moses, the author of Genesis, could not be clearer. The explanation for Abram's fall lies in the events of the original fall. Let me say that again. The explanation for Abram's fall lies in the events of the original fall. That means that Abram's fall and its explanation lies in Abram's human nature. It's the fallen nature that he inherited from the first man who fell, Adam. He's a sinner. Abram says in his heart and actions, as does Sarai, God's not and I'm God. That's what lies at the heart of this fall. And here then is the obstacle of all obstacles to the promises and plans of God. The obstacle is the very nature of humans, isn't it? It's their nature as descendants of Adam to sin. If you like, all the episodes of sin in the history of humanity can be written as recounts of the first sin, of the fall, because that's the essence of the human problem. It's the problem, the obstacle of sin, our sin, that God is dealing with as he makes those promises to Abram in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. And the consistent behaviour of Abram reveals why sin is such a problem. But I think we can go a little further. For this passage actually pushes us to consider more deeply both the cause and effect of human sin. Uh, Remember, a definition for human sin that we've been using is that the attitude and action that says God is not and I'm God. And this account, just like the account in Genesis 3, this account pushes us to consider why we would ever say that. Look closely in verse 2 at how Sarai states her consideration of the problem in front of her and Abram. Sarai said to Abram, since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave, perhaps I can have children by her. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. Sarai recognises the truth. God's in charge of these events, even her barrenness. Yet her behaviour reveals what she does with that truth. She takes matters into her own hands because she betrays and reveals her doubt about whether God can, will, or is even able to do anything about her plight, whether God is good enough to do anything. And again, there's a very clear parallel with Genesis 3. Adam and Eve both recognise the truth as they interacted with the snake, but like Sarai, their actions revealed they doubted the goodness of God, his ability to follow through on his word. Here then is the start of sin and the essence of its evil. It's a doubting of the character and nature of God as revealed in his clear words. Let me say that again. It's a doubting of the character and nature of God as revealed in his words. From there, as we see in both Genesis 3 and Genesis 16, it's not far from doubting God's words to then doubting his goodness, his ability, and then deciding that we know best about what we can do with this world. We know better than God. In fact, we can step in for God. And then the fall is complete. That is, I think, the clear statement of this passage. This is how sin starts and progresses. But it then pushes us a little further to consider the effect of that decision-making process, the effect of that fall, that sin. On the one hand, we see in the sin of Abram and Sarai and Hagar the effect of Adam's sin. All humans are fallen by virtue of being human. 
But Genesis 16 then shows how sin, it, all sin being the same, hear me clearly, all sin being the same in its rebellion against God. Genesis 16 then shows how sin can often vary in its ripple effects. It doesn't make some sins worse than others. Again, hear me clearly. It doesn't make some sins worse than others. But it does alert us to the truth that some sins affect more widely. Do you see? Do you see how this sin ripples out and damages all in its wake? Do you see how this sin affects generations and generations through time? Just follow the name of Ishmael through the accounts of Genesis. Do you see how it fractures relationships and taints love and undermines trust and rips away intimacy and destroys devotion and lays the root of bitterness and conflict? The effect of sin is unavoidable. And people are forced to face their responsibility for their sins. This sin doesn't produce the promise that Abram and Sarai hoped for. It only produces more obstacles. This man and this woman now must face their own responsibility for the mess that they've made. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, we recognise that truth in our lives, don't we? We recognise the truth of our sin, where it starts, where its roots lie. We recognise that this reminds us of its deep and permanent stain on our lives. We recognise the cause of sin, the doubt about the the goodness of God, his ability to follow through on his word, his capacity, his nature, the action that then takes hold and undermines the character and goodness of God and even seeks his place on the throne. And unfortunately, we recognise the effects of sin in our lives too, don't we? In our lives, in our relationships, in generations to come all too often. Is there any hope? Is there any hope in this account? Can anything good come from such a sordid debacle? I'm going to point three on the outline. Look at verse seven. The angel of the Lord found Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She replied, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Again, like we saw in Genesis 13, God's appearance in the account is critical. It's the turning point, isn't it? Hagar is nearing her homeland of Egypt. She's exhausted. Someone appears to her, finds her. In the end, she realizes that it's not just an angel, but it's the Lord himself. His question is puzzling, isn't it? I mean, God knows this. God knows what has happened. Why is she fleeing? What, what, what has taken place? So why does God ask that question? Well, again, I think we're meant to cast our mind back to a similar question time when God asked the whereabouts of his people. In this case, there are only two other occasions so far in Genesis, aren't there? Genesis chapter 3 verse 9 and Genesis chapter 4 verse 9. And then in Genesis 3 9, God asked Adam where he is. And in Genesis 4 9, God asked Cain where his brother is. Both are occasions of significant sin. Both are moments when the story changes only at God's intervention. And I think we're to look to them to see the significance of what God does here. Just like those two occasions in Genesis 3 9 and Genesis 4 9, here in Genesis 16, God intervenes with a question. Just like those two occasions here in Genesis 16, God's intervention is the turning point. Just like those two occasions here in Genesis 16, God's intervention is a moment of both judgment and mercy. The judgment here is very clear. God does not condone anyone's behaviour in this episode, but he makes them face the reality and responsibility and effect of their own sin. Look at verse 9. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, You must go back to your mistress, submit to her mistreatment. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I'll greatly multiply your offspring. They'll be too many to count. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, You've conceived, you'll have a son, you'll name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your real cry of affliction. This man will be like a wild ass. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. He'll live at odds with all his brothers. Hagar, go back. Serve your master and mistress. The child's to be born. The child will be wild. He'll be a loner. 
in constant conflict with the world around him. Abram, Sarah and Hagar cannot avoid their sin. Just as David says in Psalm 51 verse 3, Psalm 51 verse 3, I'm conscious of my rebellion. My sin is always before me. Can you imagine breakfast time in David's palace, faced by Bathsheba? As these three lives in Genesis 16, as these three lives interact in this camp, God's judgment is clear. They must bear responsibility for the effect of their own sin. And it will affect them. And yet at the very same moment when God brings judgment, he also brings grace, doesn't he? Undeserved mercy, undeserved kindness, undeserved generosity. The only good that comes from this episode is the very mercy that God brings when he judges. The child will live. Abram, Sarai and Hagar will live. The child to be called Ishmael will be a permanent reminder of the fact that God does hear the distress of sinful humans. God does hear and God does answer. Hagar herself recognises the wonder the God of all people has visited her, spoken to her, saved her, pronounced a significant blessing on this child. It's the same with Adam and Eve. They face the effects of their sin and stand under the undeserved mercy of God. It's the same with Cain. He wanders the world bearing the mark of the mercy of God. It's only the intervention of God that deals adequately with the obstacle and the effect of human sin. Abram's behaviour betrayed his inability to do anything about his own sin. It was only God that could deal with both the sin and its effects. But notice that God does so in justice and grace, in judgment and mercy. Such a contrast. The disaster of humans like Abram, Sarai, me, you, taking matters into their own hands and the wonderful intervention of God to deal with it for them. Such a contrast stands at the heart of how Paul understands these events as he writes about them in the New Testament, as he understands the actions and consequences of the life, death and resurrection of the descendant of Abram, Jesus. Paul sees in both Hagar and Sarai's sons, the other reading we had today, a reminder of the events and the effects that we've just seen. To take the promises of God into our own hands and to try and bring them about by our own intervention, to say God needs me. In fact, I can do God's job better than him. That's the worst of foolishness. It only serves to show how incapable we are of trying to deal with this world, our own sin, by our own hands and our own deeds. And that will only inevitably lead to the mess of Sarai, Hagar and Abram. Conversely, to turn to the intervention of God alone is the only way any lasting solution to the obstacle of our sin will ever be provided. It takes the intervention of God the intervention that is both judgment and mercy, just judgment, undeserved mercy. It takes the intervention of God alone to deal with human sin. And is that not what happens at the cross? Judgment and mercy. The fulfilment of the promise of God to deal with our mess for us in judgment and in mercy is revealed at the high point when the descendant of Abram dies, having lived the perfect life for people like us. Now, we know the truth here of the judgment of God, don't we? We experience it every day in our aching bones, in our fractured relationships, and in our shattered dreams, and in the falls of greatness around us in the way in which the ripple-on effect of our rebellion against God, thinking we could do better than him, damages us and all of those around us. We know that. But do we know the undeserved mercy of the intervention of God for us? Let me plead with you to know the great goodness of that intervention. God speaks 
God asks your whereabouts. And then God shows that he understands them already. There's no sin, no sin beyond such intervention. There's no rebellion, no rebellion beyond the reach of such a question. Now, the effects of sin will not be wiped away until the last day. But the eternal consequences of them will be handled by God for you at his intervention. Let me ask you again. Have you experienced the intervention of God for you in his mercy? Let me pray. Father, we give you thanks that here in this world of modernity, we can read of your intervention in the fall of this great man, your intervention of judgment and undeserved mercy, your stepping in to deal with the issue of sin and its ripple-out effects, your consistency in the way in which you deal with humans who think they can be God instead of you. Father, thank you that that reaches a climax on the cross where in Jesus Christ dying, For us, we see your judgment and mercy hand in hand like you've always acted. Father, like we heard last week, help us to take you at your word in this, to trust you to have done all this for us. Father, transform us in this. Change us, restore us, forgive us, and bring us back to you. Amen.